Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Five Reasons to Use Case Statware, with our presenter, Cynthia Case. Welcome, Cynthia. Thank you. And I'm Betty Smith. I'm the Vice President of Communications here at CQG. And as always, before we get started, I'll just run through a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, if you have any technical difficulty at any point during the webinar presentation today, please use the chat feature. In the webinar view, that's located in the middle of the right hand of your screen. Uh, when we're in full screen view, that'll be the chat feature and the floating toolbar at the top of your screen. Also today, we'll be taking questions at any point during the presentation. Uh, Cynthia will welcome those. So please, if you have questions, please use the Q&A feature in the webinar view. That's the bottom right hand of your screen. When we're in full screen view, that's on the floating toolbar as well. As always, today's webinar will be recorded, and the recording will be available to you within a few days on our news site, news.c2g.com. So I think that covers all of the basic housekeeping. I can introduce Cynthia. Formally, Cynthia is an award-winning technical analyst. Uh, her studies and indicators have been available in CQG Integrated Client for over 15 years. Uh, even though Cynthia's firm, uh, Case and Company, specializes in energy, uh, the Statware trading suite is good for any liquid market, equities, forex, you name it. So, with that very brief introduction, Cynthia, I am going to pass the presentation off to you. Very good. Thank you, Betty. And uh, let me see if I can move the slide forward. Having a little trouble doing that. Um, let's see if that works. No? Either the space bar or the arrows. Space bar, arrow. Um, neither seems to be. There we go. There wow, we go. great technology. Well, good. So we're, today we're going to talk about case statware, smart indicators. Why, why are uh, five reasons to use case statware, and why, are case, why is case statware smart? So uh, case's uh, trailing stop system, case dev stops, uh, pinpoint exits. They help you to not only figure out when to exit, but also how to shape your exits to your risk appetite. Uh, statware indicators uh, self-optimize, self-auto-adjust, uh, and uh, generate color-coded signals so they're easy to use. The uh, indicators eliminate uh, the need to look at multiple time frames because they use multiple time frames. It's embedded in the math, so you don't have to look at multiple time frames. Um, also, most of our indicators include multiple sub-indicators. It, as it was. So our entry system, for example, which we're going to talk about in a minute, uh, includes four um, indicators, one of which is in a higher time frame. Um, the case indicators are designed for what I call precision trading. As Betty alluded to, and as some of you know, I used to be an energy trader. I didn't have the uh, uh, option to trade soybeans or um, apple. Yeah, or et cetera. I had to trade crude or natural gas or heating oil or jet fuel, et cetera. So my trading could not rely on pure diversification for, uh, for profit. I had to trade single commodities um, precisely. And uh, the indicators that we have are statistically predictable, and we'll show you how that works uh, as we go along. All right. So the first, the first uh, uh, indicator we're going to talk about is uh, the case dead stops. Now you might be wondering why I'm starting with the exits or stops, um, and that's because I don't want to get caught up in the beginning of the talk in the trading technique. I just want to talk about each indicator on its own, and then we'll put it all together at the end. Um, here we have uh, two women. One is, uh, one, as you can see, one is tall, one is uh, not so tall. And uh, in actuality, for the entire population of women, the 97.5 percentile is about six foot three. But if you get a homogeneous population, like let's say the Rockettes, 
uh, the uh, 97.5 percentile uh, might be 5.9. Uh, f- uh, in both cases, the average, let's say, is uh, 5.8.5 or something like that. So you can see that even though in two different populations you might have the same average, in the general population you're going to get some very tall ladies. In the Rockettes or a similar chorus line, everybody's going to be about the same height. So you can get two different populations that have the same average height but have very different uh, 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 heights at the, at the 2.5 probability point on the upside. So that means if you're going to have a door for the first population, you'd have to have it very tall. And if you have a door for the second population, you'd have to have it not as tall. And a stop is the same way in the sense that if you have two populations, like these two up here, uh, that have exactly the same uh, average true range, average height, let's say, of the bars, here is 450 and here is 450, but the um, standard deviation in the, in the left population is 50, and the standard deviation in the right population is one-third that. And so if you're setting a stop with the market on the left, you're going to need wider stops to let the market breathe so you won't get stopped out on noise, where on the, if you have a market that's very regular, you don't need quite as large as stops because um, a, a noisy bar is going to be smaller. In actuality, if you look at the uh, distribution here, this is an actuality of the true range, not the average true range, but the true range of individual bars. Uh, this is over a 25-year period, so a lot of bars. But you can see that it's skewed to the right. And all markets over time look like this. They're all skewed to the right. So the way that we uh, develop our stops is we look at uh, standard deviations of true range above the mean, okay, because those are the ones that you're concerned about when you have big excursions. And we look at one. 2.2, adding 10% to the second standard deviation, and 3.6, 20% to the third, uh, for our stops. And because we're using standard deviations, our stops are probabilistic. So if you got stopped out at our first level stop, there'd be an 85% chance it was random, and a 15% chance that the market would be trending in that direction. And then 97.5 and 99.9 for the second and third level stops. Okay, this is what the stops look like within CQG. And um, the D here is double true range. It uses standard deviations of a double true range. And all a double true range is is the true range of two bars. You kind of make a synthetic bar like this, and that's a, a, a double bar. And uh, you can see that even though the math behind it is rather uh, rigorous, that it looks pretty simple when it plots. So the red line is what we call the warning line. It's just to give you a warning when market's turning. And then we have our three level stops. So you can scale out over stops one, two, and three. This is, the, this is, the, this is another picture of the stops again. We've got the uh, warning line, you have one, two, and three. And you can see that in a nicely trending market, in a highly trending market, we don't even hit the warning line. But in a nicely trending market, the stops will stay below the third level. You can see on the upside, they, they stay um, above the second level. Here's more of the same. Now, one, one of the things you might be wondering is how the stops flip. You can see the stops are above the market here and below the market here, above the market here. Theoretically, the stops could be front-ended with any kind of an entry system. We use a 10 and 21 moving average just to have the stops flip. So when the 10 is below the uh, 21, the stops are above the market. When the 10 is above the 21, the stops are uh, 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 below the market. And um, so you can, you can change that, that setting. Okay, I just wanted to see if I had... Um, an example of changing the setting, but if you want the stops to flip faster, you can just change the settings to be faster, like a 5 and 21, or you could use, let's say, a 21 and 34 if you wanted to slow it down. Now, people ask me all the time, what do I do if the stops are in the wrong direction? 
And I tell them there's no such thing as the wrong direction because if you have a, if you have a reversal like this, and let's say you're getting long in here, you can use the stops in the opposite direction as resistance. And you can see how the market uh, came right up uh, this as support and um, as resistance here when it when the market turned. So. Um, and uh, I should mention that in, on our uh, website, uh, casestatware.com, we have an FAQ, a Frequently Asked Questions section, if you want to refer to that. All right, so one of the things that uh, the stops can be used for, in addition to just exiting, is to figure out what your risk is. So, for example, in this market in here, if you were to use stop one, your risk would be 22.1 cents and 28.4 at stop two and 35.7 at stop three and so forth. And you can see here as the market becomes more volatile, the, um, these are called reversal values. These are, these are the value of the stop, the numerical value of the stop. You can see as the market becomes more volatile, the stops become wider. So here that the stop was uh, 35.7, for example, at depth three, and here it's 55 cents at a depth three. So you can know what you're risking, and you can also use that risk um, to, um, to uh, calculate how many contracts you can trade. So for example, uh, let's say you have $15,000 that you're willing to risk on any one single trade. The reversal value, the Dev3, at Dev3, let's say is 35.7 cents. You just divide your 15,000 by 35.70 which is the amount uh, per contract, and you get uh, 4.2 contracts. Now, as the market uh, becomes more volatile and this number rises to 55, you divide your 15,000 by 5,500, and you can trade two contracts if you want to be somewhat bold, maybe three. Here's an other example, a real similar example. The only difference in this example is that the stops are going from wide to narrow instead of narrow to wide. But again, you can know exactly how much you're risking. Um, well, exact is a difficult word. Approximately how much you're risking, because of course you have you know, slippage and other things. But here you're risking $4,300, where here you're risking $3,210. And so again, uh, you can go into the same calculation, let's say in this case, you're willing to risk 20,000. Here um, is your risk per contract. You're dividing 20,000 by 4,300. You can trade four contracts or maybe five if you're brave. And then here, you, the risk decreases, so you could add two contracts to your, um, or you could add well, one or two contracts to your total uh, because the risk has diminished. I mentioned earlier that the uh, case indicators are statistically predictable. And here's an example of what we mean. Uh, for example, let's look, at, let's look at this column here. In this column here, the warning line's been hit, DEV 1's been hit, and now DEV 2 has been hit. So I know that DEV 3 has a 72% chance of being hit. If I change my stops to look at four and a half standard deviations or six standard deviations, I know that now that DEV2 has been hit, there's a 31% chance for a close beyond six standard deviations and so forth. So this is what we call a hit-hit table. If such and such is hit, what's the odds that something else will be hit? But we also have hit-close, close-close, close-hit, et cetera tables. So what you can do is you can take these tables and you can look at the risk at any particular time, if one of your stops is hit, of the other stops being hit. And you can shape your exit and your risk accordingly. The other thing you can do, of course, is judge the probability of a move to a certain price target um, and trade in that direction of the target based on these probabilities. OK. So here's just. Um, Here's just uh, an example of um, where the stochastic 
didn't, um, I think this is the stochastic, didn't give a momentum divergence signal. So there are no exit signals here to tell the trader, nothing here, nothing here, nothing here, to tell the trader to exit. So this is a case where if the trader was using the stochastic only and relying purely on the stochastic to tell uh, him or her to exit, here's a, here's a dev three exit here, a dev three exit here, and a dev three exit there. Now we're going to move on, whoops, we're going to move on and talk about uh, the case uh, momentum indicators. The, um, the illustration on the left shows a, a random walk. So what it does is that, I mean, hypothetically, this could be a close to close type of uh, uh, move. And what it's showing you is that after n steps, more or less, the, uh, the uh, quote, drunk is going to end up back at the lamppost because his act actions were random. Uh, if you actually plotted his, um, his steps where he was at any given point in time, uh, you would find him, uh, you would have a, a normal distribution. So the probability is, the highest probability is he's going to be back at the lamppost. And you're going to get a very small standard deviation. It's not going to get too far away. Whereas the right, on the right-hand side, the uh, walker is, uh, has a journey. He's going in a particular direction. He has a trend, so to speak, in his mind. And you can see that uh, he's not going to his destination in a straight line. He's zigzagging back and forth. But ultimately, by evaluating where he is relative to um, where he is relative to his starting point, you're not going to get a normal distribution. Let's say if this was the starting point, you might get something like this um, after a certain number of steps. So you can look at um, the, um, the, the distribution of where uh, this particular walker is after n steps and make a judgment based on the um, distribution of the, act of, the, of, the, uh, of the distance um, as to whether or not it's random or serially dependent. And that's, ba that's the kind of basic idea that the case indicators are based on. Um, this would be a purely random price distribution. So, <clears throat> this would be a purely random price distribution. So the way that we look at serial dependency um, is we take this, the, the volatility, which is a measure of standard deviation. Volatility is the standard deviation of the logarithmic rate of change. And what's interesting is that the word volatility uh, likely was in use before the actual formulation of how to calculate volatility was, uh, was developed. And so the term volatility, if we were going to name it today, we might call it uh, standard deviation of price or something like that. So that's the standard deviation of price uh, is, is, um, is shown there. And then you can measure the logarithmic rate of change in actuality rev relative to the volatility. And so the farther, the farther prices go, and this is change in price. So it's not like Bollinger Bands, which is just price. This is change in price, logarithmic change in price. Uh, so the farther prices go ro logarithmically relative to the standard deviation, the less probability there is that the market is random, or to put it differently, that the market is serially uh, dependent. And I'll just take a few seconds here to tell you what serial dependency is versus uh, non-random. Um, let's say uh, let's say a, uh, a young person is at a uh, is uh, at bat at a little league game. Everything that brought that person to the um, uh, to that point might be random, his parents meeting, uh, 
the moving to a town that had a little league team, all of that. That could be considered all just kind of random chance. But um, once the ball and the bat, uh, once the ball hits the bat, I'm sorry, the bat hits the ball, what happens to the ball for a certain number of feet is dependent on what happened to that ball the moment before. So the bat hits the ball, and then something happens to that ball that was dependent on the bat hitting it. And then a second later, uh, the ball is at a particular point because of what happened to it a second before, et cetera, up until a particular point when that runs out. So that's serial dependency. So case momentum indicators uh, uses this statistical basis to check for standard deviations of price up and down. I mentioned uh, logarithm of P over PN, so it varies N uh, for cycle length and finds the best periodicity of cycle length, normalizes the result for volatility, and um, we'll see in a moment that the results are more accurate than traditional indicators by a factor of about uh, 55%. Um, just for those of you uh, who are not familiar with momentum divergence, uh, momentum divergence consists of a lower low in price and a higher low in momentum, equal or higher low in momentum. Uh, we see a bullish divergence here. We have a lower low in price and a higher low in momentum. Here we have a higher high in price and a lower high in momentum. And even though I'm showing this to you, uh, a lot of people have trouble. Um, a lot of people have trouble uh, uh, identifying uh, momentum divergence. So one of the things that the case indicators do is automatically draw the momentum divergence on the chart for you. And so you don't have to know what momentum divergence is in order to use cases momentum divergence signals. The signals are drawn automatically on the chart. And just one more point, even if you do know uh, what momentum divergence is, once in a while you'll get two lows or two highs that are so close together that you'll have to get your cursor out to figure out what the values are. So this also eliminates the need to do that. So here's yeah. the case piece. Sorry, it's Betty. Yeah. I, I did have a question if okay. you would like to take one. Um, this question is from Cole. And he said, I'm sorry, I missed a couple of slides. Can you give a specific example with prices off of one of your early charts of first level buy, sell with at least one fade and the exit point? Well, we're going to do some trades at the end. I haven't given any trades yet. Okay. All we've talked about is exit indicators so far. So we haven't talked about buying or selling yet. So um, if you're patient, we'll get the whole story in a few minutes. Um, so um, here we have a lower low in price and a higher low in momentum. And uh, here we have a lower low in price, higher low in momentum, higher high in price, lower high in momentum. So this is how the case indicators work. That would be an, uh, an exit signal. So uh, one of the things that uh, I do want to point out is that uh, because the case indicators are self-optimizing for cycle length and volatility, they trigger in cases where the other indicators uh, do not trigger signals. In addition, uh, because of the optimization, rather than being overbought for long periods of time like this, like the MACD is here, um, they tend to compress an overbought or oversold signal to one discrete point. So here we have an exit. We have a higher high in price, lower high in momentum, lower high in momentum. The stochastic is non-divergent, and the uh, MACD is non-divergent. Um, here again, uh, these little lines here, that their function is to show you uh, peaks. So right here, there's a peak in the peak oscillator, the KPO, and we know that because of the PL here. And again, here is a peak in the KPO. It actually doesn't trigger to this bar. But in any case, the stochastic is non-divergent, and there are no exits generated by the stochastic the whole time. So the bottom line here is, is that um, 
the case indicators perform better than the traditional indicators. And so we're asking how, how, how they predict the, uh, that the market will turn. So the question here is, if there's a signal, how often following that signal does the market turn? Here, the first uh, item here are the best two traditional indicators, which happen to be the RSI and MACD, um, and uh, the, best two, the best two case indicators are 75%. So what this is telling us is that there's a mar if there's a signal, there's a 71% chance that you'll hit DEV1 if you're using traditional indicators, and a 75% chance if you're using case indicators. However, there's a very big difference, and I haven't calculated, but it's over 50% better. I think it's about 66% better uh, for the big turns. So if you have um, a, uh, a signal with the traditional indicators, like RSI and MACD, there's only a 28% chance that you're predicting an excursion to the third level stop, where with the case indicators, there's a 43.5% chance that you're projecting a, uh, a move to the uh, third level stop. A more pertinent question, however, is how often do, uh, how often do indicators precede turns? So rather than looking at, I have a signal, do I get a turn after it? I'm looking at turns and looking back to see how often um, I got a signal. And here the, the, the difference is much more dramatic because you've got 59% uh, for all three uh, traditional indicators and 80% for the case, 55 versus 82%. So what this means is, um, what this means is that um, you can rely on the case indicators to tell you that there's going to be a turn. So. There's only a turn 20% of the time that we miss. Where with the traditional indicators, it's better than 40%, and for the larger turns, close to 50% of the time, that you don't have any warning that you're going to have a turn. So this is, this gives you the capability of exiting uh, with a certain probability before the turn actually takes place. Okay. And just real quickly, I'm not going to read the slide. You can go back and take a look at it. But because of the different probabilities associated with the different signals, that depending on what exit happens, you can shape your exit strategy. So the, this particular exit strategy assumes that you would like to get out at DEV1 if you want to. The probabilities would be different if we were using DEV3 based on our uh, the the slides I just showed you a little bit ago. So here we have the 80 percent, um, 80 percent, and 82 percent here. Um, but going back one, we have different probabilities for the um, for the follow through. So now I'm going back here. So, for example, if we have divergence on both the KPO and the KCD, we'd exit 100%. And again, as I said, you can kind of check these out on your own. So here's an example of an 80% divergence. We only have one momentum indicator with the divergence. We see that by the red line. Once that happens, we exit 80%. We pull our stop in to DEV1 because I said this particular strategy is based on DEV1. We pull our stop into DEV1. And, uh, and exit the remainder when we hit DEV1. Here's an example of a peak out. This is an overbought signal. You can see it happens at a discrete point. We exit 80%, pull our stops into DEV1, and then we exit 20% as we hit DEV1. Here's a double divergence, 100% exit. There's both the KPO and the KCD um, are uh, triggering. We exit 100%, and we can see that all the stops were hit. Okay, now we'll talk about our entry system, and then we'll move quickly into um, some, some actual trades. The, the
the entry system uses four different uh, elements. It uses swing lines to look at swing highs and swing lows. It uses three momentum crossovers. It looks at the bar pattern. Is the bar rising or falling? And it uses the case permission screen. Uh, the case permission screen uh, uses a rolling uh, higher time frame window. Uh, as shown here, it updates every bar. So rather than, for example, if you're trading a daily, daily and you're uh, filtering it with a weekly, rather than having to wait till Friday to get a signal, on Monday you get a week that ends on Monday. You get a five-day five period that ends on Monday. On Tuesday you get a five-day period that ends on Tuesday, et cetera. So that the, the, the filtering system updates every day based on the higher time frame without using uh, uh, the time frames frame in series, it uses overlapping time frames. And this is what the case permission stochastic looks like in the screen. Uh, basically, it gives you, you know, a red light for a market going down, a green light for market going up. Uh, so, so what happens is, is that um, this all translates into um, blue signals for going long. And uh, the <clears throat> if you only need one bar up, blue, <clears throat> if um, the permission is long and you have one rising bar, you need two rising bars if you have a cyan color, because that means that the permissioning is neutral, it's in transition. And if you have, if it's not permissioned long, uh, you get the dark blue and you need three, uh, three rising bars. And the third one has to close higher. And then it's the opposite for the uh, for the short. We use red. Oh, my guys made a little error here. This should be that's a two down. But uh, you, we have a pink, and then we have sort of a kind of a dark magenta looking color, and then we have the red for short. We wait for second or consecutive signals to get long, and that's just based on the idea that. If you're going to have a trend, you're going to have an A, a B, and a C, or a 1, 2, 3 at least. So we wait for the second impulse wave to get short or long. Okay, so here, is, um, here are some examples of our entry system. And I'm moving kind of quickly because I want to get to our actual trade examples. So here is a uh, first cell. We have a little one there to sh tell you that it's, you only needed one bar down. And then you have a pullback and a second cell right in here. So this is where you'd get short if you were uh, trading trading this market. From the bottom here, we have a first buy. And we know that uh, a first buy, the second class, is a little two. And but then the market comes down and breaks this first swing low. So when, when we break the swing low, we start counting all over again. Come up, you have a first buy. You make a new low, you start counting all over again. Come back up, here's a first buy. And in this case, the low held, uh, and then you got a second buy and consecutive buys. Okay, so here are some actual trades. And these are kind of simple. We do have some examples of multiple time frame trades and some more complicated trades. We wanted to keep it simple for our examples here. Here we have a first sell. We have a little number one show up. We have a pullback. We have a second sell because we have a second one here. This swing high held that swing high. So this is where we would be short, stay short all the way down. We get a, uh, an exit signal, a, um, an oversold signal. So we exit 80% of the trade. We pull our stops in to stop one. Stop one gets hit right here, and we would um, exit the remaining 20% of the trade at that point. Okay. Here's a very similar example. We have a first cell. We see a little one here. We have a pullback and a second cell. And we, um, we enter short here. We stay short all the way down. And uh, for those of you who, um, who are interested, um, uh, for those of you who are interested, uh, 
the um, the little ones here are the first the first uh, level uh, cells, and the twos are the second, and the threes are the threes. In any case, you have a little peak out here where you would um, normally um, exit 80 percent, and then you get back in 20 percent on this uh, on this bar. So if you're wondering what happens when you exit 80 percent and then it doesn't hit Dev one, you just get back in like we did here on the next bar. And so down at the bottom, we have a divergence. We get out of 80 percent again. Pull our stops into Dev one. Here's where we hit Dev one. We're out of uh, the remaining uh, 20 percent. More of the same. This time we have buy. Here we have a second class buy. And you can kind of see that cyan color. So we have a first buy, pull back, pull back holds the low, comes up again. We have a, uh, a second buy. This time it's a first class with a one, although it doesn't matter. One, twos, and threes are the same weighting. Um, it just it, This is just to tell you what the class of the signal was. So this is where we'd be long. We stay long all the way up. Here we have our overbought signal. The little uh, letters actually show up here. This is where we'd exit 80%. We pull our stops in. Um, and what's happening here is, is we had from the high one, two, three, four bars till we hit the warning line. So that's why we have may accelerate. You may want to pull your stops into the warning line rather than dev one because we've just had the sideways movement. And we call that inactivity. But in any case, if you're just following the rules exactly, this is where you would exit the remaining 20%. Okay, well, that leaves us a few minutes for some questions. All right, and as I mentioned earlier, we're happy to take questions through the Q&A feature. Uh, we just had like a, a kind of a logistics question. Um, Cynthia, LM asked if you're willing to share a copy of the presentation slides. Yeah, um, just um, take this uh, email down here and just write to us at askcase at caseco.com. We'll send you a copy of the slides. And I should mention that uh, uh, the case statware is available at uh, no charge for a 30-day trial. And we like, to give, uh, we like to give lessons. So if you'd like a, uh, a custom lesson on the phone with us, uh, just uh, call us and let us know. Normally your salesperson would let us know, but just in case, you can call us directly. Um, to get a trial, just call your CQG rep, and you can see the number here. And again, um, you know, we like to give lessons. If you go to our casestatware.com site, we have all kinds of uh, archived videos and webinars and FAQ and a lot of things like that. So. Um, Wonderful. Cynthia, I have a question from Kelly. Do you still recommend using a higher time frame screen, or have you revised this technique from your earlier guidelines? Well, the higher time frame screen is built into the entry system. So you don't really have to make a decision about it. So um, if I can go back, let me just uh, um, this. This screen here is the higher time frame screen. It's built into the entry system. So you don't have to make a decision about it. Now, I think it's defaulted to either three or five. Um, if you want to um, use a shorter screen, uh, you can set it to maybe three. And certainly if you set it to one, that, it, that eliminates it altogether. But um, our defaults are usually about five on the higher time frame filter. And you don't have to, again, you don't have to make a decision about it. It's built into the entry system. All right. Uh, we don't have any other questions at the moment. I'll just make a few notes about our next webinar and see if anything else comes in. Okay. Uh, so our next webinar will be August 16th. It will feature Richard Weissman. He's a senior associate with the Energy Management Institute. He's also author of Trade Like a Casino. So that will be on August 16th. And I don't see any other questions. So, Cynthia, I just want to thank you so much for the presentation today. It was You're welcome. Fantastic. And uh, if 
you did have a question. Uh, as, as Cynthia mentioned, you can contact her directly at Case and Company. Right, and ask Case. I'm trying to get back to that slide. Okay. If you want to ask Case, write to ask Case at casego.com. Right. So either Cynthia or one of the members of her team will follow up with you. And as I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, the recorded webinar will be available in a few days on our real-time news site, and that's news.cqg.com. All right, thanks again.